you guys for leading us in worship this morning. Well, good morning, church. I know you've already been greeted, but I hadn't had a chance to greet to a lot of you, so good to see each and every one of you, and word to the balcony up there. Hey, we got several of you guys up there. Uh, I can still see you, so don't fall asleep. And for those of you who were worshiping online with us, we're always grateful to have you with us as well. How many of you remember the 60s? How many of you should remember the 60s and you just don't? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, not everything that came out of the 60s was all bad. Um, many of the people were rebelling against uh, war and they wanted peace in the world. And uh, what's interesting is that a lot of, the, a lot of people, um, we called them hippies back then. Uh, how many of you were hippies back then? Anybody? All right, you got a couple of people admit to it, yeah. And um, what was their call sign? Peace, man. Make peace, not love. Or make peace, not war. Um, so what's interesting is in 1975, a group called War came out with a song about peace. Why can't we be friends? How many remember that one? Why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? Right. The heart of the song is about peace of the races and the color of your skin don't matter to me as long as we can live in harmony. Well, we live in the cancel culture today and where the very same people who are demanding tolerance are not tolerant unless you agree with them. And um, one comedian rightly pointed out, that's not tolerance, that's just called agreement. Um, tolerance is supposed to go both ways. And boy, it just seems like we have a lot of people that are polarized and they're angry all the time and there's so much opposition. Um, there's even a t-shirt out there that says, I'm not arguing, I'm just explaining why I'm right. You know, People are insisting on being right all the time. And as long as two or more are gathered, there shall be how many opinions? Three. Yeah. Somebody's listened to my sermons before. Yes. Uh, as long as there's two or more gathered, there's going to be at least three opinions. And so we start getting passionate and we argue and, and we fight. And, you know, it's one thing uh, for us to fight with the world because the world, uh, let's just say they think so worldly. Uh, but here in the church, uh, there are even divisions within the church. And some people get really upset about that. But do you know it's been happening since the church was birthed over 2,000 years ago? Uh, so today in our passage, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church in Rome. And there was a conflict within the church. Jewish uh, and Gentiles were starting to meet together and the fur started flying. They started arguing over things like who could belong to their club and what they could eat and what day they could worship and so on. And so while the Jerusalem council came along and they answered a lot of things about the laws, which ones we're we going to hold to, which ones we're we not going to hold to, uh, we're not going to hold them to circumcision. There's just a few things. But the apostle Paul uh, came along and he got right to the heart of the matter and how tr Christians should treat one another, especially in areas of disagreement. So let's take a look at our passage today, uh, Romans chapter 14. It's entitled, The Weak and the Strong. Except the one whose faith is weak. I just felt like I need to explain this right away. Who's the one that has the weak faith? What's interesting within the context of the scripture is the one who's weak in the faith is the one who insists on my way is right. So if you're one of those people that lives in a black and white world and you're always right, you may want to think about this one here. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. That has nothing to do with being a vegetarian or a meatitarian, okay? It, it has to do with whether you're going to eat the meat that was in the market, which had already been sacrificed to some pagan god or idol somewhere else. 
And so they were having trouble with that. And they said, well, if it comes down to that, I'm just going to eat vegetables alone. Verse 3. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must uh, not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. And whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. And then you, and you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind to not put a stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but the, of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, so the whole context of this passage is actually speaking about love and peace within the church, within the body of Christ. Now, last week we quoted from the song, you know, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Yeah, I still think that goes. And certainly when um, Jesus came and said, you know, peace to the world. It's, it's, it's peace among all people. And that's actually God's invitation and his love for everyone in the world. That's why he sent his one and only son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world by dying for them. But we in the church have been called to a higher standard. There are some things with people who think worldly, we're never going to agree. And that's okay. But within the church, there's only a few things that we're supposed to really agree on. And then there's other things that are moot or debatable or the gray areas, which certain people still have strong feelings about, but somebody else may think differently, and neither one is contradicting Scripture. 
And so let's take a look at some of these things. Um, actually, how many of you ever saw the movie, I think it was out last year, maybe even the year before, The Jesus Revolution? Anybody? All right. A number of you went out to see that. I understand there's another good movie out there, but I haven't had a chance to check it out myself. Um, so if you like that kind of thing, uh, you may want to check it out and see uh, what movies are playing. Um, and certainly this is a, a Christian one as well. Uh, but in the Jesus Revolution, it really tells the story about the beginnings of Calvary Chapel. And uh, Pastor Chuck Smith admitted uh, that he did not like hippies, okay? So this is going back into the 60s, and, and uh, the hippie movement was in full force, and there was lots of hair and no shoes, okay? I mean, yeah, uh, many times drugs were involved or drinking was involved or something like that, and so um, what he calls the, the, the crew cut and brown tie crowd had a real problem when the hippies started coming to church, because they don't share the same kind of values. I know some of you can remember um, back in the day, if somebody showed up, they'd be turned away from church if they weren't dressed right, if your haircut wasn't right. And so this is the, the tension that was happening because the people who were already a part of the church liked their church just the way it was, and they didn't want any of those people coming in from outside. And so Chuck Smith, he admitted that he really didn't like the hippie culture. He didn't like the hippie people. And um, his wife said, well, you better start praying for him because I guarantee your daughter is going to marry one of them one day. Well, his daughter brought home uh, a now famous person. His name is Lonnie Frisbee, and he's passed away now. Um, but Lonnie Frisbee came into Chuck's home, and it gave Chuck the chance uh, to sit down and really talk about the things that bond them together. Lonnie had already been converted. He'd become a Christian, and so they could gather around it. In fact, one of the lines of the movie is Lonnie said, Hey, Chuck, we're, we're, ju we're just like you. All of us out there are just looking for truth. And that registered with Chuck, and so he began to listen and began to change his heart. The, the ice, if you will, started to thaw, and then he did something terrible. He invited Lonnie to church, and then Lonnie did something terrible. He invited his friends to church, and then suddenly the whole church was in an uproar, and they even had people stand up in church and say, Pastor, if you don't kick them out, I'm out of here. And at some point, Chuck had to say, okay. And when they started inviting more and more friends, the trustees of the church got really all up in arms because they had just replaced the carpets. And now all these hippies with their dirty feet are going to come in. So Chuck Smith took a page out of the Bible. And before anybody could come in, he made them take off their socks and shoes. And he washed the feet of everyone who came in to the church. But from that point on, the church started growing. Some people got upset and they said, well, if that's the way you're going to do it, then I don't want to be a part of this church anymore. And they left. And sometimes that's the money people. But Chuck knew in his heart this was the right thing to do to open up to all people who were seeking Christ, even if they think differently on some things that are are disputable and so he invited more and more of them Lonnie invited more of them hippies and surfers started showing up for church and the church continued to grow that was in the 60s now it's uh, 60 years later and there are now over 1800 Calvary Chapel churches throughout the world yeah And so I, I, I tell you that story to say that our own church, uh, Spring Life Church, has gone through a number of changes. Some of you have been here for a very long time, and some of the changes um, have maybe been hard for even some of you. 
Uh, there are so many things that have happened from staffing changes to name changes to COVID to changes within the denomination to changes calling for unity, changing of style of services and style of dress and effort to reach younger families. And many people could not handle that. And so many people walked away and they left the church. Now, I want you to know from a pastor's heart, we hope that they just walked out of our church and into another church, and they're still a part of the family of God somewhere. Um, I have said this before, probably 20 years ago now, um, standing on the front of the stage because the little church that I started and was serving, uh, some of you have heard my story where I started a church and I had a great plan and I had a great idea for a church and then all the people came and messed it up. Right? I mean, because that's what's going to happen. There are no perfect people. There are no perfect churches. But sometimes the tension gets in there. And I just stood up at the front of the stage and said, hey, people, this is a volunteer organization. Either volunteer to be happy here or volunteer to be happy somewhere else. But just be happy. But the worst, something that I have found is many times the people are unhappy go somewhere else and they're happy until something makes them unhappy and then they're going to be ha unhappy all over again and then happy people are just god-filled god-blessed pe peaceful kinds of people that said okay whatever i'm going to call out one person because she's passed now and she's in heaven but one of my favorite people in the whole world was miss pat who worked with our children's department for 40 years. And no matter what the changes or the challenges, he said, that's okay. You know, we've done with more, we've done with less, and let's just do what we can with what we have. She always took everything in stride. And when I grow up, I want to be just like Miss Pat. We've had many of these challenges ourselves. And what we want to be about Spring Life is a church where everyone that feels loved, welcomed, invited into worship and to fellowship, and to fellowship with one another in peace and love, guided by scriptural integrity. Now, I know many churches, they just kind of want anything goes. We don't say anything to anybody, but it's like, no. We are a church of Jesus Christ. We are followers of Jesus Christ. And he, uh, through the Holy Spirit, has left us a book to help us understand what is right and what is wrong, what is moral, what is good, what is sinful. And so we have a responsibility as the followers of Jesus Christ. And in fact, you know, some of you knew I, I felt personally challenged by the sermon last week because I knew it was going to make somebody mad. Well, there's a good chance I make somebody mad every single week. And I heard somebody say once to a pastor, said, well, if you want to be in the people liking business, you're getting into the wrong business. What you are called into is the faithful business. And what I'm called to be is faithful to God's word. Now, as we launch into some of these, uh, what I call Paul's recipe for peace within the church, you know, there's something to keep in mind. Um, and it just, you can't give every sermon all the time. There's always more to be said. Um, and one of the things is, you know, we're going to talk about it is, you know, thou shalt not judge. Are there times for us to stand up? Yes. Are there times for us to, to go to a brother and sister in love and say, you know what? I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about the direction you're going. And um, if you're interested in that, that's actually Matthew 18. We are our brothers and our sisters keepers. We are supposed to care for them out of love, not judgment where we come down on them, but we come alongside of them and say, I'm worried about you. I care about you. So there are times for us to speak out, and there's times for us to take one another to the scripture and said, look at this. I recently had somebody said, you changed my mind on something with glory, hallelujah, 30 years of ministry. I finally changed somebody's mind. Um, but the fact is, because they saw it in the Scripture, they went to Scripture, and we let Scripture inform us along the way. But 
That withstanding, here's Paul's recipe for peace within the church. And the first one right there in verse 1 is for us to accept one another. Um, You know, I do believe that we have become a part of a culture now where people are more readily acceptable to people who are coming into the church who might look different or act different or dress different or hairstyles are different or something. And that is a wonderful thing where we can just accept it. I remember one of these stories that I loved from years ago, and, and there was a teeny little church, and it was they liked their church the way it was, and every, all the men dressed to the nines. They had spit polish shoes, and, and they had three-piece suits and, and ties. And, and one day, um, there was a hippie that came in, and he came in late, and he was barefoot, in jeans, long hair, And he just couldn't find a seat in the little church. And so he just sat down in the aisle. Well, everybody just was shocked when a little old man from the back row stood up and started walking down the aisle toward this young hippie that is now sitting toward the front of the church in the middle of the aisle because they knew that he'd been a part of this church for over 50 years. This was his church, and those people don't belong here. And they just knew that it was headed for a showdown. But when he finally got up to the young man, very carefully he grabbed a side pew and sat down with the young man. It spoke volumes without ever saying a word, saying, my brother, You are loved. My brother, you are welcomed here. When it comes to the church, we are supposed to accept one another. And when people come in from the world and they don't know what to expect, many of them are are actually frightened or afraid, like the Moonies are there. you you, you, You don't know what those people are like. Some people, I'm always fascinated when they when they tell me after church, say, This was my very first church experience in my entire life. And I pray that it's a good one. I would remind you, keep the yammering down in the pews because somebody new might be sitting around you and they're paying attention to how we treat one another. But we should always not just greet our friends when we come to church, But we should greet everyone. We should look them in the eye and genuinely welcome them into the church, even if they're different from us. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Amen. So we put our personal preferences aside and love as Jesus loves. The second thing is to refuse to argue over disputable matters. And it's important that we say over disputable matters. Paul was not saying, well, anything goes. And there's, there's a phrase out there today that, well, we're just called to love. We're just called to love. We're, we're just called to love. Well, I think true love takes somebody to the authority of Scripture and says, here's how we are to order our lives. I think that's more loving than just allowing somebody to keep living what the Bible would say is a sinful lifestyle. If they're coming into the faith of Jesus Christ, then we have the responsibility to come alongside, to love, to encourage them. But can I say there are a lot of gray areas? And in fact, the Apostle Paul was pointing out some of them. They said, some people think one day is more special than another. We still have groups of people who think we're sinning by worshiping on Sunday because everybody knows the original day of worship was actually on a Saturday. So therefore, we're supposed to worship on Saturday. Some of you know that the Christians started worshiping on Sunday because it was a reminder that that's the day that Jesus Christ changed the world by being resurrected from the dead. And so when we gather on Sunday, it's in honor of him, and every Sunday is a little Easter It doesn't mean those who worship on Saturday are wrong and those who worship on on Tuesday are wrong or those who worship on Sunday are wrong. It doesn't matter. He's saying one day is not more special than another. 
And so that was one of the things that they were arguing about or the different foods and, and the things that have been sacrificed to idol for the Jews for, for generations. They weren't allowed to touch it and they were still beholden to the old laws, the, the old dietary laws and they weren't sure if they were actually free. Paul, who comes out of that kind of family, who comes out of that kind of tradition says, I'm convinced that we've been freed from all of that. But I'm not going to sit down and have a BLT next to my brother who can't. Do you understand the difference? He said, there's no, no day is different or, or better than another. But worshiping God is important. But choose the day that you're going to gather together with your, your friends and your neighbors and to worship a holy God. The foods don't really matter. But what matters is that we're caring about the people who still think it's important. Now, um, I grew up in a family that did not drink alcohol. And the reason is because I had great grandfathers on both sides of the family that were alcoholics. And over the next three generations, they just said, you know what? We don't want anything to be in control of us. And we didn't like the way that they became uh, through the alcoholism. So we're not going to touch it. And so that's the family that I kind of grew up in. And then one day, um, on Saturday morning, I guess my parents must have had a Sunday school party the night before. And I was walking in. Um, I was usually the first one up in the morning, and I'd get my own uh, bowl of cereal. It was usually either Quake or Crisp. Anybody remember those? Yeah. And I, and I got my cereal out, poured it in the bowl, then I went to the refrigerator, and I went to get the milk out. And... <gasps> Oh, somebody had put a bottle of wine in our refrigerator. And I was beside, I'm pretty sure I went and woke my mother up. I mean, there's something evil in the refrigerator. Why is it here? Have you all lost your minds? Have you gone to the dark side? And mom said, calm down. Somebody didn't know we weren't drinkers. Brought it last night for the party. It's okay. We'll get rid of it today. Okay. Well, it's the family that I grew up in. But then it turns out there's other families that drink sociably all the time. And so it's not one is better or more right than another. And in fact, it doesn't say not to drink wine. Paul actually tells Timothy later, he says, uh, you need to drink a little bit of wine. You have a nervous stomach, you have an upset stomach, it'll calm you down. There are sometimes on a Friday night or something where maybe Chris and I have had a stressful week, and sometimes we say, I sure wish we kind of liked alcohol sometimes because I hear how it calms you and relaxes you. Um, it doesn't work for me because uh, I can't get past the taste. But it's not that one is right or one that's wrong. Absolutely, um, what we should not do is for somebody who thinks it's okay to drink alcohol to insist on drinking alcohol with somebody who thinks it's not right. There are people, there are churches who insist on abstinence from alcohol. Uh, some of you know this, um, actually back in the 1860s uh, at the request of a Methodist minister uh, Dr. Welch actually came up with the first unfermented grape juice. And that's, we've been using grape juice uh, because we know there's many people that even just one little taste can send them over the edge and make them desire drinking. And so for uh, the last, you know, 250 years or so, uh, we've been using grape juice for communion. It's not about one right or more than the other. We just do it out of love and out of sensitivity for those who do not drink or cannot drink. So we, we toe the line on things that are clear in the Bible and we give grace for people who think differently about those that are not. Um, this line has been uh, quoted, um, or given credit to everybody from St. Augustine to Wesley, but it's something that we should hold on to. In the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. Let me read it again. In the essentials, unity. 
in the non-essentials, liberty or freedom. Think and let think. But in all things, charity. Love one another. Number three, stop. (laughs) Some of you need to pay attention and wake up for this one. Stop judging people. Some of you just feel like you got it from your mama who got it from her mama or, you know, so the, the, the gene was just passed down and it's not my fault and I can't help it. I just come from a family that does that. It seems to be a part of the natural DNA where we have a tendency to judge other people. Can I just say how much easier it is to point out somebody else's problems than to deal with our own? And yet... The Apostle Paul is saying, don't do it. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus warns us not to judge one another because if we do, then the same measure that we judge others, God will then judge us. If we do not give grace for others, then we will not receive grace from God. That needs to be a wake-up call for some people. But I think there's a reason for it, too, is that um, we get so upset when we see somebody else doing something that we know is wrong. Um, But people who tend to be judgmental, they tend to be miserable people because there's a, a lot of people that they have to spend time judging. It's constant. It's always on their mind. And so they're constantly judging other people. But God wants those who are judging everybody else to be freed from the burden. I remember one day when my uncle, who's now a retired pastor, said to my mother, you're not doing such a great job running the world, so knock it off. (laughs) Yeah. Stop judging others. If we have hope for God's grace for our sins, then we should have grace for one another and just choose to be nice. Stop judging. Number four, choose relationship over being right. I will tell you, this one will save marriages as well as churches. Um, Did you know that, (laughs) and if you're married, you probably know this one already, But did you know that you can be wrong just by being right? Yeah. You know, we all have our opinions and we're all sure we're right on things. And and there's no doubt. There's a time to stand up for things that we know are right. But there's some times on these disputable matters that we really need to just let it go and choose relationship over being right. One of the stories that I've heard years ago was about a a man that was sitting in a bar with his buddies and they were just drinking and knocking them back and said something about, well, how's your wife doing? Uh, Well, she's gone. Um, Thank God, because she was wrong. And I'm telling you to this day, I was right. And he kept on and on and on about how right he was. And then Finally, he looked at his friend and said, aren't you going to say anything? He says, yeah, she's still gone. (laughs) And many times, relationships have come to an end, whether it's a family relationship or a marriage relationship, and because we've just insisted on being right instead of choosing the better way of love and saying, okay, we kind of disagree on this matter, but you know what? You're still my brother, you're still my sister, my husband, my wife, my friend. I still care about you anyway. So we call to choose relationship over being right. To see the person and not the problem. And then I'm going to quote from the greatest possibly theologian of all time. Thumper. (laughs) If you can't say something nice... Don't say anything at all. We need to put that thumper filter into our brains. 
We need to sanctify our thoughts before they come out of our mouths. And we need to choose when to speak and when to be silent. Number five, why? Why should we do all these things? It's so hard. It's so natural to be me. Why, why do I have to work on these things? Why do I have to keep working on them? Because God wants us to. Do we really need anything else? Paul tells us that this is what makes God happy. When he sees people who are caring for one another, loving for one another, listening for one another, allowing for freedoms in disputable matters, and being able to live and to let live. If we will let God be God, let him handle the judgment, then we, our homes, our churches, and the world would be a better place if we kept all these principles in mind. And then I just have to confess my own struggles over our own denominational changes and challenges and all that. Um, I, I will say um, that for me personally, um, I do not feel like I left the United Methodist Church. I feel like the United Methodist Church left me. And it comes down to scriptural integrity. And so they're erring on the side of love. I'm erring on the side of love according to scripture. I don't think it's our right to start taking sins out of the Bible. Do you know that they've made up new Bibles now where they've eliminated all the problem areas when it comes to gender or homosexuality or anything like that? There's something out there called the Queen James Version. And they've taken out every passage that would might make somebody feel bad. Our job isn't to make somebody feel bad. Our job is to come aside them in love and say, my brother, my sister, I care about you. I love you. And I'm worried about your future with your relationship with a holy God. God has determined what's right for us. We don't have the right to, to determine for ourselves what we want to be if we want to be Christians and we need to follow him. But if we would let God be God, let him handle the judgment, then we, our homes and churches and the world would be a better place. And if we cannot think alike, may we not all love alike. And that's what I have the greatest heart burn over the way our it's not that our denomination has decided to part ways it's okay because we think differently about things division in churches has been happening since the very first churches it's not new it's happened before it will happen again but what I think we will be judged for is the way that we handled it there's no way in the world we should have ever handled it with the vitriol and the anger and the hate. Nowhere in my Bible does it call for that. Called for differences, but to love one another. If we cannot think alike, may we not all love alike. And it's my prayer for this church that we would be a people who seeks peace for our own sakes, for his sake, and for the sake of his kingdom, now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious and our holy Heavenly Father, you are holy and you are God. And you are set so far above us. You are the uncreated one. We are the created beings. 
And we do not have the right to choose to do whatever we want to do, but actually you've given it to us, the right of free will. But it's the desire that we even override our desire to be free is the desire to be a part of your kingdom. And so, Lord, we pray your blessings to be upon us. We pray your blessings to be upon this church, Spring Life Church, as we look to seek and to pray and to encourage and to grow. I'm grateful for the Calvary Chapel that that made changes 50 years ago, 60 years ago now. And yet now they have given birth to so many churches throughout the world calling people to scriptural holiness and integrity and love. I pray that we would be that kind of people. And as we come down to even our own, within our own church family, we know there's people who disagree. Heck, I even disagree with me sometimes. But the thing is to not disagree to the much where we have to part from one another on disputable matters. One may like one kind of music better than another or one style of dress better than another, but none of those are dictated in the mandates of scripture. And so those are disputable matters. And I pray that we would not want we, what we want so much that we would walk away from somebody else. But in humility, humble ourselves, our thoughts, and our opinions and look for good and the ideas of others or even in the changes that we make along the way that we feel like you have called us to make along the way and I pray that this would be a church of your Holy Spirit and a church of revival and Lord, we're people who have been without any kind of guidance or who are lost and maybe alone or afraid or not knowing what to do or how to move or how to act or how to be right with you. Lord, that they can come into this place no matter what they look like, no matter the style of their dress and that every single one of us would be like the old man who looked different than the hippie, but sat down and joined him at your throne. Lord, may we be that people. For those who are judgmental, Lord, soften their hearts and just teach them the way of love. Teach us all. Lord, we thank you for these and all things in the name of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who showed us the way of love and taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.